This is a 2003 Audi RS6, and it is one of my all-time favorite Audi models ever. You see, the rest of the world has gotten high-performance Audis for years, going back to the RS2 in the early 1990s, and then RS4s and RS6s and RS SUVs, but not in America. Only recently has Audi started giving us its best high-performance models, and the U.S. market only got the RS6 once, for one model year in one body style, the 2003 RS6 sedan. And today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this RS6 from Motor Cars of the Main Line, which is an independent dealership here in the Philadelphia area that always has the coolest and most varied and most interesting inventory. Everything from a 1980s Cadillac to modern BMWs to exotic sports cars to this RS6. There are always about a dozen cars that excite me every time I go to Motor Cars of the Main Line. So what's the deal with the RS6? Well, like I mentioned, Europe and other markets Markets have gotten many different versions of the RS6 over the years, but this is the only one they ever sent to the United States, only in 2003, only as a sedan, and it used a turbocharged V8 with 450 horsepower and 415 pound-feet of torque. Those were monster numbers back in 2003, and this was the fastest sedan in the world at the time, along with the supercharged Mercedes E55 AMG, which came out the same year. But there were problems. Lots of problems. As awesome as the RS6 was and is, as these cars have aged, they have shown themselves to have some issues, shall we say. The transmission is not capable of handling this car's torque and power, and it is known to fail. The turbos are known to fail. This car's dynamic ride control suspension system is complicated, and it is known to fail. And there are other smaller issues on this car, too, as there were from all Audi models of this era. This car is not cheap or easy to own. But yet, I'm still drawn to it. This ultra a fast Audi that looks like a regular old A6 to everybody except people who know. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of this car and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of the ultimate Audi sedan. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the RS6, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer where I've also rounded up a list of the coolest older Audi models listed for sale right now on Autotrader. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the RS6 with one of my very favorite things about this car, and that was the exterior styling, and specifically just how subtle it was. Like I mentioned, this was the fastest sedan in the world when it was on sale, and yet you could barely tell. That's very different from modern cars that are so loud and shouty about how fast they are. So here are a few ways you can tell apart the RS6. One, obviously the badge, RS6 on the back. That was an easy giveaway. You also had dual exhaust back here and a different rear diffuser that looked a little bit more aggressive than the one in the regular A6. Up front, you also had another RS6 badge integrated into the grill, although this one was really, really subtle. You had to know what you were looking for. And and this car had different wheels than the standard A6, although they weren't that different, so obviously giving away that you were looking at a version with twice the horsepower of the base model. Another subtle upgrade was back here on the trunk lid. The regular A6 models were just rounded back here, but this had a tiny little spoiler that sort of gave away what it was. My favorite exterior modification to this car, though, undoubtedly, was the fenders. In order to accommodate wider wheels and tires, they had to flare out the fenders just a little bit. And if you're into this kind of thing, you get up behind one of these in traffic, and that one extra inch of flare on either side is enough to let you know you're not looking at a regular A6 2.8 and that this was the real deal. But it was only those little subtle modifications to the exterior of this car that gave away that you were looking at the fastest four-door car on the road back in 03. And I just love how subtle and slippery it was. You had no idea what it was until it was beating you. 
Now, it's also worth noting that, generally speaking, I've always loved the look of this particular generation of A6, which was sold from 1998 to 2004. It had this very nice rounded look, and it really signified that Audi was readying itself to compete with the big players, BMW and Mercedes-Benz, at least in terms of design. So you already had a good base car, and then you just tweaked it a little bit for the RS6. By the way, one other exterior update to the RS6 I really liked was the mirrors. You can see the back side of the wing mirrors is silver, which was a distinguishing feature for Audi S and RS cars. They had the silver mirror trim, and it was one of those things, again, where you only knew that that meant it was something special if you knew. And next up, we climb into the RS6, and the first thing you're struck by when you get in this car is just how simple it is, especially compared to modern cars. There's not that much attempt to style the interior, for instance, no swoopy lines all over the place. You just have a simple steering wheel, simple gauge cluster, simple center control stack. The simplicity of this interior really strikes me, especially after 15 years of advancement with more complexity and more technology getting into cars. And frankly, it really complements the simple exterior design of the C5 Audi A6 with its nice, clean lines. Now, another interesting thing in the interior of the RS6 is, once again, you can barely tell that you're in an RS6 when you get in this interior. There's only a few badges in here. You have one at the base of the steering wheel, it says RS6, and then you have another one in the gauge cluster on the tachometer, it says RS6, and then on the seats themselves, it says RS6, and that's it. Otherwise, you might just think you're in a standard A6 interior, except with all the features and a lot of nice trim. Contrast that to modern cars like the Ford Focus RS, where there's 84 RS badges in the interior. I kind of like the subtle look of this one. But despite the fact that this interior is a paragon of simplicity, there are still quite a few interesting quirks and features in here. And I want to start with the cup holders. Now, this era of A6 was clearly designed without any cup holders in mind, and so they had to add them as afterthoughts and squeeze them in where they had room. One of the places they squeezed them in was in the center control stack. Next to all the buttons and the radio, there's a cup holder. You push this little plastic thing and then it pops out in this very over-engineered German way where it comes out and then kind of comes down. Now, the interesting thing about that cup holder, though, is if you actually put a drink in there and then it's a hot day and the drink starts to sweat, the liquid from your drink will start to drip directly down onto your radio, your climate controls, your gear lever. It is a truly terrible place for a cup holder. Although it is not the worst place in this car for a cup holder, the other cup holder is in the center console. You lift up the lid and then there's a cup holder there. Only one problem, the lid doesn't stay up. So if you actually want to put a drink in there, obviously the lid will just knock it over eventually unless you like hold it in place, which is just truly terrible design. But anyway, back to the center control stack, because there are a couple of interesting quirks worth mentioning in here. Starting with the heated seats, it's this little dial you use to turn them on, and it goes all the way to six. There are six different levels of front seat heating in this car. So if you're on four and you're like, I want more heat, you can turn it to six. No, that's too much. Let's go back to five. As if anyone's butt is sensitive enough to actually feel the difference between six levels of seat heating. Also in the center control stack that I like, in the very bottom in this little storage tray, you have the ashtray and the cigarette lighter. And I like the fact that when you open it up, the cigarette lighter pops out and then up to be aimed towards you a nice piece of design in this car. And next up, moving down from the center control stack and into the middle, and you can see the transmission lever. This was Audi's Tiptronic Automatic from this era. They put it in basically everything, and it simply didn't have the capability to handle this car's power and torque. The torque converter in these transmissions failed constantly. In fact, they were often going bad so quickly that they were failing under warranty, and Audi was having to replace them. Unfortunately, this is the only transmission this car was ever offered with, at least here in North America. You could only get that Tiptronic Automatic. Now, next up, staying in the center 
center area here, moving back towards the seats. I already mentioned the cup holder inside the center console, which was weird. The other weird thing about the center console was you could put it back if you wanted to. You could simply lift it up, it would tilt, and then you could put it away and it would lock in place there. And then you didn't have to deal with the center console if you didn't want to. If you then wanted to bring it back out, you kind of push this little plastic piece at the end and then you could lower it into your desired center console position. This really was more intended to just be an armrest, but I think after a while they realized they needed cup holders and then it had a dual purpose after that. Now, next up, another interesting item in this car is the sunroof and specifically the fact that when you look at the car from the outside, the sunroof is glass. But when you're in here, you can't like pull back the sunroof cover to allow light to come in even if you don't have it open. And that's because beneath the sunroof glass, but above this cover in the interior, this car had solar panels mounted. And if you look at it from the outside, you can clearly see there are solar panels in the sunroof. So what exactly was that for? Well, the theory was that the solar panels could take in light and then store it and use the energy to power the climate control system when the car was off so it could keep it cool on a hot day or whatever. The Volkswagen Group did this on several models from the time. I remember it was also in Bentleys, but obviously it added a ton of complexity and you couldn't just open this little cover and have light come in through the sunroof glass. And so eventually they just ditched it. But there was an era where Volkswagen, Audi, Bentley models had solar panels in the sunroof to power the climate control when the car was off. Now, when you're in here and you wanna open up the sunroof, you can do that just like normal. You twist this little dial and the sunroof opens all the way. It's just that you don't have access to that panel that allows light to come in. Interestingly though, the sunroof can still tilt. If you put it in tilt mode, it tilts up and then this Alcantara sunroof cover kind of curls up in order to allow just a little bit of air and light to get in when it's in tilt mode. A very strange operation for this sunroof. Now, two other interesting things in this area by the sunroof. One relates to the sun visors. The sun visors in this car are pretty normal. You just put them down like usual. But in this car, like in all cars, there's still a little area where sun can get in around the rear view mirror. But Audi thought of that and there's a little plastic additional sun visor that comes down to cover that area above the rear view mirror. That is brilliant design and really thinking everything through. Another interesting thing in this area, you can see this car has an OnStar button, which is very unusual because we all associate OnStar with General Motors. But there was a small period in the 2000s where Volkswagen like contracted with General Motors to stick OnStar in some Volkswagen and Audi models. And this car is obviously one of the ones that had it. So it has the OnStar system equipped, just like you'd get in a brand new Chevy Equinox. Now, next we move on to the door panels. And as you can see, the door panel is very simple with only the basics, everything you need and nothing more. One thing I like is the fact that there are two different door panel storage areas. You have one large one, and then you have one very small one, which isn't quite big enough for my wallet, but it almost fits. So you have two different places where you can store stuff on the door panel. My favorite door panel item though is on the seat memory. You can see there are three different memory settings and then there's a bright red button marked stop. Apparently if you pressed a memory button and the seat was moving and you didn't want it to and you wanted it to stop, instead of just pushing the seat controls, you could also press this red stop button as like a panic thing. We must stop the seat. <laughs> and then the seat would stop moving. Very interesting to see like an emergency power seat stop button in a car. Another interesting item in the door panel area is the trunk release, which is not actually on the door panel, but instead on like the B pillar next to the driver's seat, you press this little button and that releases the trunk. Not sure I've ever seen it there in any other car. And next we move on to the gauge cluster, which again, like I mentioned, pretty simple. Tachometer on the left, speedometer on the right. In the middle, you have a very rudimentary version of a gauge cluster screen with these red pixel dots. These are always going out, but they're perfect in this car. And this screen was divided into four different sections. On the top, you had the music, whatever radio station or CD track you were listening to. Then you had the outside temperature. At the bottom, you had what gear you were in. And then the third one in the middle, that was configurable. And in order to configure it, you press this small unlabeled button at the end of the windshield wiper stock. You push that. There was no explanation that that's what you had to do. But if you did it, you could cycle through like your range and your average fuel economy and your average speed 
speed, and those sort of basic driving functions. Now, speaking of the signal stocks being weird, over on the turn signal stock, you have some of the strangest cruise controls I have ever seen. You push this little button at the end to lower your cruise control speed, and you pull this little switch in the middle to the left in order to raise your cruise control speed, and it just was not very user-friendly. The weird thing is Audi didn't put any buttons on the steering wheel. They easily could have integrated the cruise controls into the steering wheel, but for some reason, Audi wanted their steering wheel to be buttonless. And next we move on to the back seats of the RS6 where there are more interesting quirks and features, starting with the fact that the rear seats are heated just like the front seats and just like the front seats, you have a dial that gives you six different levels of seat heating. So all together in this car, there are 24 different levels of seat heating between the seats that you can be on at any given time. And next up, a few other interesting items back here. One is the fact that the RS6 has fold down coat hooks they're on the ceiling next to the rear grab handles. You fold them down and then you can hang your coat or your suit or whatever in the back. You also have rear sunshades, although I am pained to say they are merely manual. You have to put them up yourself but at least they're there. And another interesting item back here comes when you fold down the center armrest and you can see that behind it, there's this little compartment with what appears to be like a sack or a bag. That is the ski sack. The theory was that if you wanted to transport skis in your RS6, but you didn't want to mount ski racks and your skis on the roof, you could put them in the trunk. And then this little bag was built into this center area in the rear seats, and you could kind of stick your skis through it, and they would go all the way into the passenger compartment, but that bag would be around them to make sure that no snow or ice got in your RS6 interior. Another interesting item with this fold down rear armrest, it does not contain cup holders like so many of them do, but instead it contains the first aid kit. I guess Audi's war on cup holders continued to the back seat where they decided that a first aid kit was more important than having a place to put your drinks. And next we move under the hood and you can see the incredible engine in this car. Like I mentioned, twin turbocharged V8, 450 horsepower, 415 pound-feet of torque. Those are still big numbers today and they were huge. 15 years ago. But anyway, with one quick glance back here, you can clearly see why this generation of RS6 was doomed from the start to have problems. This version of Audi A6 came out back in 1998, and back then I strongly suspect that they were never thinking they would stick a twin-turbo V8 into the engine compartment, so there's basically no room for it. They had to really cram it in to get it in here, and that meant that in order to access basically anything important, you have to remove the entire engine. Not oil changes, simple stuff like that, but a lot of the things that broke on this car meant you had to get in and remove the engine, which is one of the reasons why it is so costly to maintain and repair the RS6. There just wasn't enough room to work in here because this engine barely fit. And in fact, the engine compartment was so small that they didn't have enough room for the battery in there. And so Audi had to relocate the battery to the trunk. But the problem with that was there wasn't enough room in the trunk for the battery either. So Audi decided to just stick it on the trunk load floor, basically over to the right a little bit, but right there where you would want to put cargo. And then they covered it in this cloth cover. And that's where the battery just sits in the RS6. It was the only way they could make the packaging work. So if you have a regular A6, you have more cargo space. But if you have an RS6, a lot of it is taken up by this battery hump in the trunk. Now, other than that, the trunk in this car is fairly standard. Nothing particularly unusual back here. Normal sized, except for the battery hump. And so those are the quirks and features of the RS6. And now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the RS6. I've wanted to do this for a long time, ever since this car came out. In fact, I still remember when I saw the first one of these when I was 15 and I saw my first RS6. Uh, I just lost it. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, but it had its issues. I had a guy come up to me while I was filming this in the parking lot. He said, hey, I had one of those, and he wanted to check and see if it was his old car, and it wasn't, but he said I traded it in a few years ago, and I said, let me guess why. Transmission problem? He said, yep, torque converter went out. I said, suspension problem? He said, yep, had problems with the active suspension. <laughs> he said,
and I was having all these problems and I just couldn't do it anymore off warranty and traded it. But he said it was still one of his favorite cars he's ever owned and that's how it went with these. Everybody loved them, but nobody wanted to be responsible for owning them. The drive is still great. The sound is surprisingly good. I like the simple interior. The car feels very well put together. This one is exceptionally low mileage, 62,000. It's in pretty nice shape as these things go. No pixels missing from the display screen, which is a common problem. The feel of this car is just fantastic. To me, this car feels like the next level from an E39 M5. It just feels so much more solid and well-built and well-constructed. E39 M5 did come out a few years earlier, um, but it was the same era of car. This thing just took it to a whole new level. Truthfully, one of the most amazing and obviously amazing things with this car, the moment you start to put your foot down, it starts to do its thing. There's very little lag. There is some, but very little. And you just feel like even a half stab of the throttle, you are gone, gone. I also love how solid and how heavy this steering feels. Um, it does not feel light like in so many modern performance cars. It does feel heavy and I think it just feels fantastic. The car is surprisingly nimble too. You think A6 and you think huge, but this was from a different era. You know, the A6 was really not that huge back then. And it, it's just not really all that big. And so you can kind of throw it around and the steering makes it feel like it's more possible. I just love, love, love how subtle it is and yet how much you know you're capable of. I love the feel of the steering. I really, really love how responsive the power is. I think this is a fantastic car and I loved all three German performance sedans from this era. The E55 that was supercharged in 03 was amazing. Um, the E39 M5 is a fantastic car, but this is my favorite. Um, not only is it rarer, but it's just everything about it I truly love. That is pretty good. And so that's the 2003 Audi RS6. This was a special car and it represented the pinnacle of Audi performance sedans in the United States until recently when we finally got the RS3 and the RS5 Sportback. This car may have its problems and its issues and it may not be cheap to own, but I love it. And I love the sleeper look where you have no indication that it is anything special until it's flying by you doing zero to 60 in 4.3 seconds. Anyway, with that, it is time to give the RS6 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I've always felt this RS6 is very attractive, though it's still a sedan and not a gorgeous sports car, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 4.3 seconds, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Handling is good for a car like this, surprisingly so. Nicely weighted steering and a relatively nimble overall feel, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is good, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Cool factor is okay. Car enthusiasts know and respect this RS6, though regular people probably won't give it a second look. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a weekend score of 30 32 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The RS6 was good back then, but it's low on modern tech and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is fine and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is really low. The interior is fantastic and the materials are great, but the rampant reliability issues significantly hurts things and it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is normal for the segment and it gets a 5 out of 10. Value is a tough call. These are way cheaper than they should be given the performance and the rarity, but people are scared to buy them because of all the problems. Problems. As a result, it can't do better than a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 25 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 57 out of 100, which places it here against some other luxury performance sedans and coupes of its era. The RS6 is great, but reliability issues and an automatic transmission will always mean it plays second fiddle to the E39 BMW M5 from this era, and the poor RS6 always gets overlooked as a result. But I love the RS6, and I love it even more after spending the day with this one. 